Uh, Hebrews chapter 11, we'll be starting at verse 8 this morning. If you would, join me in prayer one more time. Heavenly Father, our gracious God, we come to you hungry and needy, with clouded, blurry vision, and we ask that you would open the eyes of our hearts this morning to see clearly, to behold unseen realities of your promises, and above all, to behold our Savior in his glory and majesty, and therefore to be transformed, to live increasingly for Jesus. By the power of your Spirit, in Jesus' name, amen. There are some ways in which our experience of life in this world gives us a picture of deeper spiritual realities. For all of us here at ECC in Abu Dhabi, one of those ways is the reality of our life as expats. We live as expats in this country, living in a country that is not our own. Uh, many of us looking forward beyond our time here to a life elsewhere, perhaps in our home country or maybe in another country to which you want to immigrate. We live our lives for that in many ways, seeking a home, building for the future, some of you have been expats for a short time. Some of you have been expats for longer. I left India, my home country, 15 years ago, and I've lived in different places. Very familiar with the expat life. We seek to build for the future. Plan for something beyond the place that you now are. That's the expat life. And that's what the life of God's people is like, spiritually speaking. We live as expats, as pilgrims, as Bedouins, if you will, in this world. With the reality, for those of us who are in Christ, the reality of a future inheritance, a future homeland that motivates our actions in the present. Well, this morning we're returning to that great hall of faith in Hebrews chapter 11, uh, last time, the author began by defining faith for us and by taking us through the early chapters of the first book of the Bible, the book of Genesis, took us probably through the first nine chapters, Genesis 1 to 9. Today, he's going to continue through the rest of the book of Genesis, showing us the faith, especially of a man named Abraham, the faith of his family, those called the patriarchs. And we're going to see how they lived their lives as expats, as pilgrims, as strangers in this world. And brothers and sisters, as we consider the faith of Abraham and the patriarchs, my hope this morning is that we too would be certain and confident like them in the reality of something beyond this life. So that we would live with Abraham's kind of obedience to stake everything on God's promises. Even as we live as expats in this world. Just briefly by way of reminder, you remember our definition of faith that the author gives us in Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1. I told you I really like this in the KJV translation or especially the Christian Standard Bible, the CSB translation says this. Now, faith is the reality of what is hoped for, the proof of what is not yet seen. Faith gives evidence of unseen realities. It makes those unseen realities real to us and enables us to live our lives according to those realities. Faith makes real in the present the promises that God has given concerning the future. And then shapes our lives according to those promises. And as we look at our text this morning, we're going to see three promises of God in particular. Three promises of God that grow our hearts in confident certainty as we live as expats in this world. I'm going to pick it up in verse 8. I quickly want to show you the structure of the text here. 
Uh, verses 8 to 12, you'll see, is uh, one section. It focuses on Abraham and uh, his wife Sarah over there and the promises God made to them. And then in verses 13 to 16, you have this middle section, which really kind of gives an explanation of their faith and, and how they live their lives. And then in verses 17 and following, the author picks up again uh, with these characters, with Abraham and then his uh, sons and, and the line of descent from him. So there's a little sandwich there. And as I read our text, what I want you to pay attention to is the number of times the word promise appears. You'll see that's the great theme of this uh, passage. So every time you see the word promise, underline it or make a mental note there and look at me, look with me at this text. Verse 8. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith, he went to live in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. By faith, Sarah herself received power to conceive, even when she was past the age, since she considered him faithful who had promised. Therefore, from one man and him as good as dead were born descendants as many as the stars of heaven and as many as the innumerable grains of sand by the seashore. These all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. For people who speak thus make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. If they had been thinking of that land from which they had gone out, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country that is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promises was in the act of offering up his only son, of whom it was said, through Isaac shall your offspring be named. He considered that God was able even to raise him from the dead, from which, figuratively speaking, he did receive him back. By faith, Isaac invoked future blessings on Jacob and Esau. By faith, Jacob, when dying, blessed each of the sons of Joseph, bowing in worship over the head of his staff. By faith, Joseph, at the end of his life, made mention of the exodus of the Israelites and gave directions concerning his bones. The great theme of this passage is the promises of God. And we're looking at three promises of God for confidence in the expat Christian life. Number one, God has prepared for us a heavenly city. We live the expat Christian life in confidence because God has prepared for us a heavenly city. Now, you might be familiar with the context of Hebrews you should be familiar with this by now. Uh, these Christians were suffering for their faith in Christ. And Hebrews was originally a sermon preached by a concerned pastor to this congregation of sluggish, weary Christians. You see, the sufferings and the affliction they had faced was causing them to grow weary, to grow sluggish. Some of them had begun to drift they were tempted to abandon their faith in Christ in these unseen realities and revert back to what they could see in the Old Covenant. Go back to being Jews with a temple and a priest and sacrifices that you could see and smell. And they wouldn't face persecution if they went back to that system. And the author repeatedly has reminded them that you can't do that <laughs> because Jesus is better. He is the one who fulfills all of what we see in the Old Testament. He is the one who is the final, better, great high priest. He has provided in himself the perfect sacrifice that takes away sin. He inaugurates a new covenant through which we draw near to God. Jesus is better. And the author encourages these Christians not to fall away, but to live in light of Christ, our great high priest. 
And then he takes us through the Old Covenant, through the Old Testament, to show us that God's people have always lived in this way. To show us examples of faith, of holding on. He shows us numerous people who lived with certainty and confidence in unseen realities that shaped their lives and caused them to walk in obedience even in the midst of suffering. And of course, here today, he takes us to that great exemplar of faith named Abraham. Right? Verse 8. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. How did Abraham respond to the call of God? He trusted and obeyed. By faith, Abraham obeyed. I mean, we heard that read in Genesis chapter 12. Let me read that to you again. Genesis 12, the Lord said to Abram, his name was Abram at this time, the Lord said, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land I will show you. Can you imagine this guy is pretty old at this point. He's past 70. He's getting ready for retirement. He has it made. He's probably quite prestigious in society. He had great possessions. He had family. And God says, leave all that and go. His friends probably asked him, where are you going, Abraham? I don't know. I'm just going. How did Abraham respond to God's call? Verse 4 of Genesis 12. So Abram went, as the Lord had told him. The Lord said to Abram, go. Abram went, as the Lord had said. What is it that drove him? Well, God made promises to Abram. Verses 2 and 3 of Genesis 12. I will make of you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. God makes this promise of blessing to Abraham and his family. He promises his blessing. And you have to remember the context. This is coming after Genesis 3 where human beings are under a curse for our sin. And God says, I'm going to reverse that in your life, Abraham, and for all the families of the earth, through your life and through your line, through your family. And Abraham hears these promises and is gripped by the reality of God's word and God's promise, and he obeys. As one person puts it, the utter reliability of God's promise is what enabled Abraham and what enables us to live by faith. And look at Abram's future orientation of faith here. Look at what he's looking forward to. Did you notice there the contrast in verses 9 and 10 between living in tents and living in a city? Did you see verse 9? By faith he went to live in the land of promise as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. Living in a tent has a kind of instability and an impermanence about it. You pitch your tent. It's a temporary structure. You know you're there for a little while. Then after some time, you unpitch the tent, pack up everything, and you move. And you keep moving. And Abram was living in these tents with his family and they kept moving, not knowing where they were going. Walking and walking. <laughs> Whereas when you come to a city, look at verse 10. He was looking forward. What is it that enabled him to live in those tents? He was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. A city implies stability, permanence, a settledness to it. And Abram lived his entire life Waiting for that city, knowing that God would do it one day. I mean, for a good example of this, you could just think of the history of this nation, right? Think about 50 years ago, and for a long time before that, this area was desert. 
And this region was home to these Bedouin tribes who just kept wandering. They pitched their tents. They lived in one place for some time. Then they pick it up and they kept going. And it was harsh and it was hard and it was difficult. How would they find their sense of direction? Well, it's by looking at the sun and the stars and the direction of the wind. And they just kept moving. I don't know if any of those tribesmen, those Bedouins, ever imagined that one day there would be amazing cities and concrete jungles literally rising up out of the Arabian Peninsula in cities like Dubai and Abu Dhabi, which are world-renowned for their architecture and design. Well, in a far greater way, brothers and sisters, we too, as God's people, live a wandering, nomadic Life in this world, the Bedouin life. That's the life of God's people. It always has been. It was the life of Abraham. It's the life of us. But we wait, just as Abraham waited, for an amazing, glorious city. For stability, for permanence. A city whose foundation is laid by God. He is its architect. He is its designer. The city that God has prepared for those who love him. That's coming. That's a reality, even though we don't see it right now. I mean, you think of Abraham. Abraham lived in tents, moving from place to place. Even in the so-called promised land of Canaan, and Abraham dwelt in different parts of Canaan, that wasn't his home. It was still a foreign land to him. Did you see what the text says there in verse 9? By faith he went to live in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob. Because, verse 10, he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. He was waiting for something greater than what we see here on earth. He was waiting for the city of God, for God's new creation, for the heavenly city. This is one of the reasons, by the way, there are many texts that I could go to, but this text in particular is one of the reasons that I'm not persuaded of the view that there is a promised land, a nation state, an actual nation state that would be given to Abraham's descendants as a permanent possession now on this earth. Uh, If you take that view, then you're very welcome here and we can agree to disagree on that. It's, It's a secondary matter. But I think that the text of Hebrews makes it so clear here that the land promise given to Abraham is not ultimately fulfilled in an ordinary earthly land or nation state given to the Israelites, but that Abraham himself was looking forward to something far greater than an earthly land. He was looking forward to something heavenly. Even the book of Genesis ends with Abraham's family in a foreign land. All of it is future-oriented. They're waiting for something better. That's what the author of Hebrews is telling us here. Look again at the middle section there, starting in verse 13. These all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar, and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. For people who speak thus make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. If they had been thinking of that land from which they had gone out, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country. Not an earthly country, a better country that is a heavenly one. Therefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, do you know and realize that God has prepared for you a city? And it's better than Abu Dhabi or Dubai. It's better than any city that you can name on this earth. Abraham himself stands witness to you today that this world is not your home. We are all headed to a destination. As we sang, we are bound for the promised land. And no chilling wind, no poisonous breath can ever reach that shore. We are headed to the heavenly city, to the new world that God has prepared for those who love him and that Christ has already entered as our forerunner on our behalf and the ticket that guarantees that destination for you in Christ is faith. And this faith, that reality, the reality of that unseen city which is going to come 
and be all that there is one day should shape our lives in the present. This confidence that we have in God's heavenly city results should result in obedience in our lives on earth right now. I mean, you think of how Abraham obeyed, right? By faith, verse 8, Abraham obeyed. His confidence proves the unseen reality of this future homeland. The way that Abraham lives shows that it exists. And it shows his confidence in the utter reliability of God's word. It moved him to action and to obedience. So I want to ask you, dear Christian, does your future homeland shape how you live in the present? I'm, I'm not talking about the future homeland that you will one day go to after your time in the UAE when you retire or go back or whatever that is. I know that that shapes how you live in the present. I'm talking about your future heavenly homeland. Does your life demonstrate that you are seeking the city that God has prepared for those who love him? I mean, think about the people around you, family members, friends, co-workers, schoolmates. When they look at your life, when they look at the choices that you make, at the way that you live, do they see someone? Would they say that this person is living in a crazy way because they believe in an unseen homeland, a city beyond this world? Would they look at you and say that? This person is living for an unseen city. Does your life look like a citizen of this world? Or like someone who is an expat passing through, whose citizenship is in heaven? When you're faced with choices or decisions to make, and you know the conflict is between choosing something that will aid your growth in godliness versus choosing something that would cause you to stumble, choosing something that would fix your eyes on heaven versus choosing something that would more and more attach you to life on earth. What do you choose? When God's commands, the clear commands of God, come into conflict with your own sinful desires or temptations, does your desire for God, for His city, overpower your sinful inclinations did, did you see what the verse says there, verse 14? People who speak thus make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. There's a desire for this homeland. Dear brother or sister in Christ, have you grown worldly? Have patterns crept into your life to live in light of this world instead of in light of heaven? Have you begun to prioritize stuff, the things of this world, above the heavenly city? Maybe it's money. Maybe it's career. Maybe it's recognition and prestige among your family or the people you know. Maybe it's prizing a sense of security and safety and an assured future for our children. What is it that you treasure and value? What is it that drives you? Do you desire outward prosperity more than inward holiness? Is your relationship with God based on wanting to further your ambitions, your agenda, or seeking and desiring Him? You know what will reveal the answer to that, don't you? It's your prayer life, if you have one. What is it that fills your prayers? Are your prayers filled with a crying out for God's kingdom to come, God's will to be done on earth as it is in heaven, or calling on Him for the sake of others that you know? Or are your prayers filled with just asking for things for yourself, a better job, better finances, better this, better that? Would you bless me, God, with this or that? We should fix our eyes on the heavenly city. And you know what helps us to really attach ourselves to this heavenly city and, and fix our eyes upon it and dwell upon it, don't you? It's the preview tours that we get, right? 
You get a preview tour and a ticket to visit the heavenly city regularly. And even as you visit it and go through that preview tour, you get more and more attached to it. It shapes your heart to love the heavenly city more, to long for it more, to long for that day when you will be in the heavenly city forever. What is that preview of the heavenly city? Well, the author of Hebrews tells us, if you go to chapter 12, and if you're reading through chapter 12, he talks about the corporate worship gathering of the church. And he says this in verses, verse 22. He says, you have come to Mount Zion the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. We enter the heavenly city. We stand at its gates when we gather together for corporate worship as a church each week. So every week you are given the privilege of a tour, round trip, to the heavenly city and then strengthened to live life back in this world again. That's why this gathering is so important. That's why we are to come here with expectant hearts and grow in hope And then be filled with God's grace to live our lives. Because life in this world is hard. Isn't it? Even in prosperous cities like where we live, life is hard as an expat in this world, dear friends. And we have to embrace and remember that identity that we live as expats, as pilgrims, as wandering Bedouins, as strangers and aliens who are just passing through. Seeking, waiting, desiring, Longing for a heavenly homeland. And I know it's hard. Are you tired, dear Christian? Do you feel weary? I know so many of you are burdened, downcast, weighed down by the harshness of life in a fallen world. The sufferings of this life, the cares of and anxieties of this world get us down, don't they? Brother or sister, set your heart on the city that is to come, whose architect and builder is God. Desire that better country, that heavenly city, which is yours through faith in Jesus Christ. And as we begin to live as expats in this world, we do feel a sense of being strange. We're aliens. We feel a sense of being excluded from the world around us. Some of us even face affliction. Right? I know it's not easy. That's why we sing songs like what we sing. Mine are days here as a stranger, pilgrim on a narrow way, one with Christ I will encounter, harm and hatred for his name. That's what these Hebrew Christians were going through. As they sought to honor Christ, they were facing persecution, affliction, hatred, exclusion, and shame. And the author reminds them that they have a heavenly home. And they have even more. That leads to our second promise of God that enables us to live the expat Christian life with confidence. Not only has God prepared for us a heavenly city, but second, he has provided for us an eternal family. God has provided for us an eternal family. For these Hebrew Christians to whom Hebrews was written, following Christ came at a cost. And what the author is saying is, following Christ, trusting in God's promises, always comes at a cost. Living as an expat in this world means a sense of alienation, a sense of exclusion, and often shame from society. It's no different for us. Now, I know we're blessed to live in a tolerant nation that gives us the freedom to worship. We don't face outright persecution or things like that, like many of our brothers and sisters do around the world. But as Christians, we are expats living in a fallen world that is harsh and intolerant and hard. And if we're faithful to Christ, we will face a kind of marginalization because of the gospel that we proclaim, because of the Christ that we confess. And I know many of you, that's a reality in your lives. You face mocking and scorn at your workplace. Sometimes people make, you know, kind of this snide remark or joke about you being a holier than thou who doesn't participate in what they do. Many of you, dear friends, have faced rejection, hostility, shame from your own family members and friends. I remember when the Lord saved me many years ago and came to faith in Christ, all of a sudden, the community that I was part of, the rock music community, where I had dear friends and great friendships, 
All of that disappeared. Suddenly I was an outcast from that community of friends. I lost many friends and it was very painful and hard at the time. For my own dear wife, her familial relationships were deeply, adversely affected. Her brother didn't come to our wedding. It was hard. Others of you have faced the loss of a job because of integrity and Christian ethics, ostracization from your social circles. But in all of that, dear friends, do you see who stands with you and puts his name upon you? Look at verse 16. Therefore, because we seek the heavenly city, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. When we fix our eyes on his promises, on the city that he has prepared for us, when we live by trust in the God who created heaven and earth, he himself associates himself with us, makes us a part of his family, and is not ashamed of us. He is not ashamed of you, dear Christian. We've seen that previously in Hebrews chapter 2, the author has emphasized this. He said, Jesus is not ashamed to call us his brothers. He associates with us as family. And here in Hebrews 11, he says, God is not ashamed to be called our God. That's the language of family. That's the language of inclusion in an eternal family created by God. Since the beginning, God has been at work doing this, creating for himself a family. Right? You see that even here in, in verses 11 and 12. This was part of the promise to Abraham. That he would have a son. And then from that line would come a family. A worldwide family of faith. Verse 11. By faith Sarah herself received power to conceive. Even when she was past the age. Since she considered him faithful who had promised. Therefore from one man and him as good as dead. Were born descendants as many as the stars of heaven. And as many as the innumerable grains of the seashore. God promised Abram. This guy was in his 90s. They were in their 90s when this happened. God promised Abram. That through him. And through his old barren wife. Though they were well past the age of childbearing they would have a son. And the blessing of God would rest on this son and on this family, on this line. And against all odds, the God who speaks into the darkness and create the world out of nothing spoke into the deadness of Sarah's womb and brought life. God fulfilled his promise. And Abraham and Sarah trusted God. Not perfectly. They struggled. They went through a journey of learning to trust more and more. But they believed his promise. And then of course, Abram's name is changed from Abram, exalted father, to Abraham, which means the father of many nations, implying that this family would be expanded to include people from all nations, from every tribe and tongue and nation. And this family blessing, this blessing upon Abraham's family and the truth of God's promises were passed down from generation to generation, right? You see that in verse 20, faith at work in Isaac's life by faith, Isaac invoked future blessings on Jacob and Esau. And then we see it at work again in Jacob's life, verse 21. He blessed the sons of Joseph. And then in Joseph's own life, he prophesies of the exodus of the people of Israel and gives directions concerning his bones. And brothers and sisters, this family is God's own family. A family to which you and I belong through by faith in Christ. The family of the people of God into which we are added, is a family of faith. And that family has endured throughout the ages, carrying the blessing of God by the unbreakable promises of God. And though we face rejection in this world, God himself takes his stand with us, declaring that he is not ashamed to be our God. And if he is not ashamed of us, then the implication is, We ought not to be ashamed of him. That's the point that the author is implicitly making here. These people were beginning to feel ashamed of their faith in Christ. They were tempted to abandon Jesus because of the suffering that they were facing. And the author reminds them, God is not ashamed to be the God of people who live in this way, demonstrating by their lives that they have staked everything upon his promises. So I want to ask you this morning, are there areas in your life or ways that you have been ashamed of Jesus? Some of us are ashamed to speak of him. We fear what will result 
if we openly share the gospel with others, we are given opportunities by the Lord, and then we find ourselves struggling, wondering what will happen if I talk. Others here might be ashamed to associate with him and his people publicly. Some of you have professed faith in Christ for years. You come here every week, but you've never been baptized, never publicly made that identification with Christ and with his church, with his people. Friends, God calls us. His word calls you to identify with Jesus and his church. He's not ashamed of us, and we ought not to be ashamed of him. In fact, his promises are so glorious that we ought to stake everything upon the reality of God's promises, knowing that his promises will carry us through life in this world, will carry us through every trial and suffering that we may face, and will carry us even through death. And that leads to our third promise of God that we see in this text that spurs us on to confident living in the expat Christian life. Not only has God prepared for us a heavenly city, not only has he provided us with an eternal family, but third, God will perfect us in a resurrected body. He will perfect us in a resurrected body. Did you notice how Abraham staked everything, literally everything, on the reality of God's promise? Not only did he leave his possessions and his stuff and his family and his homeland and go when God called him to go, but he also obeyed and was ready to offer up his own son, Isaac, when God commanded him. Look at verses 17 and 18. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promises was in the act of offering up his only son, of whom it was said, through Isaac shall your offspring be named. I mean, it's an amazing story. If you haven't read Genesis chapter 22, it tells us the story of Abraham's faith and faithfulness in this moment. Genesis 22, after these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, listen to Abraham's posture of obedience. He said, here I am. And God said, take your son. Don't let those words just go lightly past you. Take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, your beloved son, your only beloved son, Abraham, take him, go to the land of Moriah, offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. In other words, take your only beloved son, whom you waited for years and years and years, whom I gave to you as a miracle child. I mean, they were in their 90s. Babies don't happen when you're in your 90s. Take that son, Abraham, place him on the altar, kill him with the knife, and burn him to ashes. What did Abraham do? No bargaining, no questioning. Verse 3, so Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac. And he cut the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. Can you imagine the turmoil in Abraham's heart as he's cutting each block of wood, knowing that he's going to burn his own son upon that wood? And on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place from afar. Then Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go over there and worship and come again to you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son. He places this wood upon his boy's back, knowing that he's going to go up the mountain and he's going to place his boy upon that wood and put him to that death. And he took in his hand the fire and the knife, the knife with which he's going to slay his son, the fire with which he's going to burn the body as a sacrifice. And they both went together. And, and Isaac is wondering what's going on. He said to his father, Abraham, my father. And Abraham said, here I am, my son. Can you imagine the tension in this moment? Think about it. And, and Isaac says, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. And they went, both of them, together. And can you imagine all of the tension as they're walking up that mountain 
And they come to the place of which God had told him, verse 9. Abraham built the altar there, laid the wood in order, bound Isaac his son, and laid him on the altar, on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to slaughter his son, trusting in the promises of God. And then the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he says, here I am. And the angel of the Lord says, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, seeing that you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. Of course, the Lord already knew that. But he was proving Abraham's faith, making it visible here, showing and proving that obedience is the daughter of genuine faith. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked. Behold, there was a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham takes this ram offers it as a burnt offering instead of his son. The Lord provides a substitute and Abraham calls that place, the Lord will provide. What is it that enables that kind of obedience? What is it that drives a man, Abraham, to obey God with such unreserved, costly obedience? Well, it's an amazing confidence that God would fulfill his promises, that he had seen this God speak his word and prove faithful again and again and again. And he trusted that God would prove faithful one more time, even now. And not just that, but specifically he believes that God would fulfill his promise through resurrection. Right? You may have missed it. In chapter 22, but the author of Hebrews didn't miss it. In verse 5, Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go over there and worship and come again to you. The author of Hebrews picks this up. Verse 19, he, that is Abraham, considered that God was able even to raise him from the dead, from which, figuratively speaking, he did not receive him back. In other words, Abraham believed, even if I cut up my boy and his blood is spilled and then I burn him to ashes, God is able to speak his word of power to those ashes and from those ashes will arise my son, physically resurrected with life again. That's the God in whom I believe. And friends, that is the God in whom we believe. This was the ultimate reality that all of the patriarchs look forward to. It is the ultimate reality that all Christians look forward to. That we have a hope beyond death. And we have confident trust in a bodily resurrection from the dead. Did you see the repeated emphasis in this passage on death? All through chapter 11 verses 8 and following. Look at verse 13. These all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar, looking to something beyond the grave. Verse 21, by faith, Jacob, when dying, blessed each of the sons of Joseph. Verse 22, by faith, Joseph, at the end of his life, that is, when he was dying, gave instructions. And Abram believed, verse 19, that God was able to raise his son from the dead. All of these men died in faith, looking to God's promises beyond the grave. They didn't receive those promises. They saw them and greeted them from afar. They made it clear that there was an unseen reality that was coming. In each generation, I mean, that's what Joseph did, didn't he? At the end of his life, he made mention of the exodus of Israelites and gave directions concerning his bones. He says, don't leave my bones here. Take them with you to the land to which you are going. Because God is going to raise those bones to life one day and bring me back to life. They hoped in something beyond death. And and you know, the author of Hebrews, when he's speaking of this reality, of this something beyond, calls it perfection. Perfection. Again and again, he talks about how Jesus Christ has brought perfection. The old covenant didn't bring perfection, but Jesus has. He comes, you come to the end of chapter 11, and he says, God has provided something better from us, that apart from us, they could not be made perfect. In other words, through what Christ has done, and now together with us, all who trust in Christ, God's perfection is being brought to fulfillment. They trusted in what they could not see. They looked forward to a resurrection that was to come. 
Brothers and sisters, we look backward at a resurrection that we do not see, but that has already happened and taken place. Did you see? He says, God gave Isaac back to Abraham as a resurrection, figuratively speaking. You see, Isaac's life is a preview, is a figure pointing forward to the day when God would not command Abraham to give his only son. Abraham's only son points forward to the fact that God would give his only son, God the Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, to die as a sacrifice, offering himself as a fragrant offering to take away sin. And Isaac's figurative resurrection giving back to Abraham is a picture and a preview of a far greater resurrection that has taken place in and through our Lord Jesus Christ. God raised him from the dead, offered him as a sacrifice, then raised him from the dead in a perfected, resurrected body, never to die again. We see the same with Joseph. Joseph is a picture. He gives directions concerning his bones. His bones would be laid in the grave in the hope that one day he would rise again. Joseph's bones were carried by the people of Israel into the promised land. But Joseph points forward to Jesus. The one who three days later burst forth from the tomb, arose in life, ascended victorious into the heavenly city, rules and reigns over his kingdom which will come down and one day we will dwell forever in God's presence. We will see his face and be glorified in him. Because this resurrection of Christ is a resurrection in which we all will participate by faith in him. All of us who trust him will be raised. Death is not the final word for believers in Christ. Like Joseph, we can have hope that these bones will live. I want to tell you about some dear friends of ours. Husband and wife, we have been friends. Nishika and I have been friends with them for many, many years now. They were members of our church. We were in the same small group together, sharing fellowship together. And they were uh, obeying God's call to go to the mission field. They wanted to go to a land and where Christ was not named and proclaim Christ and Him crucified to people who had not heard. And so they upped and left their comfortable life in America and moved to a very unreached and very difficult part of the world and were serving there faithfully, seeking to plant a church, share the gospel, And uh, about eight years ago, they came back to the U.S. on furlough, which is a break, kind of a vacation, and uh, Nishika and I were with them, and the wife was diagnosed with brain cancer, with a tumor the size of a tennis ball in her brain. And at the time, they said the life expectancy was undetermined, very short, maybe six months to a year. They used her condition to gain access into another nation, which was very unreached, very difficult to access, difficult for people to get in there, for Christians to get in there and share Christ. They used her condition to gain a medical visa to gain access into that place. And they went there, learned another new language. The husband was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis on the way. I'm not sharing their names for security reasons. And they were in this other nation. Nishika and I visited them there. Eventually planted a church in the local language, have shared the gospel, and and he has raised up an elder for that church. She's coming to the end of her life now. They have three kids, about the same age as our kids. And I text with this dear brother. We pray for them. And, you know, one time he sent me this message. He says this. I feel the days with my wife are coming to an end. I am meditating on Romans 8. And it has been such an encouragement. And I have told the Lord he can take her when he pleases. Friends, what is it that motivates that kind of confidence? And that kind of faith. It's the fact that our Lord Jesus Christ died for our sins 
and has been raised victorious over Satan, sin, and death, never to die again. And he promises a resurrection for everyone who trusts in him, a resurrection just like his. And here's the bigger question. How do sinners like us receive such promises that we don't deserve? Because if we look at our own lives and our hearts, we realize that we deserve none of this. Abraham deserved none of this. He was not the most upright, godly man. He failed. He struggled. He fell, even in spite of God's promises. We fail. We have all rebelled against God many a time. We have fallen short of trusting him. We don't deserve a heavenly city, you and I. We deserve everlasting hell. We don't deserve an eternal family. We deserve shame and exclusion from God's family. We don't deserve resurrection and life. No, we deserve condemnation and death. But God in his mercy sent his son His only son, the one whom he loves, his beloved only begotten son, God the son himself, took on flesh so that he was fully God and fully man. Our Lord Jesus Christ came to the rescue and he endured life on this earth. A life of wandering as a stranger, as a pilgrim, like a Bedouin. Foxes have holes and birds have nests, but the son of man has nowhere to lay his head. Enduring hunger, Poverty, sorrow. And he went to the cross where he suffered and poured out his blood, took upon himself the wrath of God that we deserve, going there as our substitute, as the sacrifice that God provided for sinners like you and I. And he died. Don't don't miss those words. He died outside the gates of the earthly Jerusalem so that all who trust him in faith will have access into the heavenly Jerusalem and the city of God. He endured shame and was forsaken so that you and I would not be put to shame. But by trusting in him, we would be included in God's eternal family. And he rose again, defeating Satan, sin and death, perfected in glory, so that all of us who trust him will have the promise of being perfected in glory. Death will not be the final word for us, but we will be raised in a resurrection just like his. And those realities are to shape how we live our lives right now, today, in this world. And if you're here and you're not in Christ, your non-Christian friend, I want to speak to you. You know that sense of knowing that there's something more to just this life and this world? It's real. And your life on earth, dear non-Christian friend, I want you to know is a wandering. That sense that you have often that you're just wandering through this life, well, it's true. And I want you to know your wanderings will end you up nowhere except under the judgment of God. But today, you can have access to God's heavenly city. You can be included in an eternal family. And you have the promise of resurrection from the dead in glory if you turn from your sin and trust in the Savior who takes away our sins and promises promises us eternal life. Would you trust in Jesus today? I told you we're expats in this world, brothers and sisters, that ought to shape how we live. I want to conclude with one statement of the early Christians in the first few centuries who faced great persecution for their faith. And here's what one person had to say about them. Christians are not distinguished from the rest of humanity by country, language, or custom. For they nowhere live in cities of their own, nor do they speak some unusual language of their own, nor do they practice an eccentric way of life. While they live in various cities, as each one's lot was cast, and follow the local customs in dress and food and other aspects of life, at the same time they demonstrate the remarkable and admittedly unusual character of their own citizenship. They live in their own countries, but only as non-residents. They participate in everything as citizens and yet endure everything as foreigners. Every foreign country is their fatherland and every fatherland is foreign. They live on earth 
but their citizenship is in heaven. Where's your citizenship? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the glorious promises that we have in our Lord Jesus Christ. And we pray that by your grace, we may live in light of our heavenly city and our glorious risen Savior, who is not ashamed to be called our God. In Jesus' name, amen.